Hey everybody, we're in the middle of a multi-part series on building an administrative database for tracking other access databases. I introduced this outline at the beginning of the series as the roadmap we were going to follow. We started along the left side and used the Jet User Roster to count and identify users of other access databases, and we covered that in parts one and two. Then we used the Jet Connection Control to prevent logins into other databases, and we covered that in part three. Next, we're going to move along to the right side of the outline and use a custom homegrown solution to provide the same functionality. In this video, we're going to use this homegrown solution to count and identify users of other databases. Hey everybody, this is Ray Harvey with Access Jitsu. Welcome to part four of our series on building an administrative database for tracking other access databases. In this video, we're going to count list users of other access databases, but we're going to Instead of using the Jet User Roster, we're going to use a custom or, shall we say, a homegrown solution. So here we are with multiple backend databases that we want to monitor with our administrative database. We want to know when these people log in to each respective database. In this approach, we're going to shift some of that responsibility from the administrative database onto the databases that we are monitoring. We're going to put a table, some startup code, and a query in each of these backend databases. The startup code is going to be responsible for logging who has logged in and inserting that into the new table. The query is going to be responsible for producing a record set that contains those users that are currently logged into the database. Now we want to treat each of these databases as though they are black boxes. We don't care what this table looks like, nor do we care what the startup code looks like or what the query looks like, as long as the query returns columns in its record set that the administrative database is expecting. That's all we care about. How it does it, we don't care. The administrative database in turn is going to execute this query and receive a record set from it. It's then going to log those users into its own table and then display them on the form like it always has. In our Jet User Roster approach, we have a table in our admin database that tells us which databases we want to monitor. We get a record set that contains those databases and we loop through them. For each one, we find their connection object in our connection object array. We use that connection, we query the Jet User Roster, we insert those users into our own users logged in table, display them on our user interface, then we go to the next database in the loop. In our new approach, we're going to have the same loop. The only difference in our approach on the administrative side is going to be right here. Instead of using the Jet User Roster, to tell us who's in the database, we're going to execute the query that we have in the each back end. We're still going to insert those users into the same users logged in table, go through the entire loop, and then update our display just like we did with the Jet User Roster. So let's take a look at our database. This is the same form that we used in part two of this series. And along the left side, we have the databases that we are monitoring, and then we have the user count, the users that are currently logged into them. I currently have my laptop, uh, my sole laptop, logged into this folder search database. As you can see here, I have a different login name. The Jet User Roster always gave us admin. This approach allows us to record the actual name of the computer that's logging in, and we'll show that to you in just a second. But as you can see here, I have a very bizarre username on my uh, laptop. I have no clue how I ended up with that. but And I also now have a login time as well. Let's put this form in design view so our code will stop running and hitting our other databases. Let's take a look at the objects we're putting in our monitored databases. First we have a table over here, audit logins is what I've called it. And I have a, I have a column here for a session ID, which is just a unique, a primary key, uniquely identifying a user's session in this database. So we have computer name, user ID, I've got open from path, that's uh, if this is a split database, let's say, you could record there where the front end is, so you could have proof positive of, of what uh, machine was logging into it, what front end was uh, logging in. Got a start date time and an out date time. So for populating this table, I have a hidden form. There is nothing of interest on this table visually. All we're interested in is the code behind it. Heading down here to form.open, there's nothing going on there except you could if you wanted that form not to be visible, and I would not. 
you could make it uh, me.visible equals false here. You know, uncomment that. In the form load, we are going to interrogate what machine this is, and we're going to get the username. Both of these are using APIs to do their jobs. And then I'm getting the path here using the current project dot full name. So we can insert those in our new table. The first thing I do here though is make sure I close out any orphaned sessions. Any sessions that don't have an out date time for this user, I'm going to go ahead and close those out, set the out date time to now. Then we'll insert a new entry into that table. Insert into auto logins, computer name, user ID, open from path, and start date time. And all that information is coming from up here. And I'm going to use select ampersand ampersand identity to get the primary key from that last table, that, that auto number, and load it into this temp variable that I can use elsewhere. I can use that when I log out to add the out date time to the appropriate row in the table. We can take a quick look at get machine name and get username. Those are above here. They both use APIs. The get username function calls API get username to do its work. The get machine name function calls the API get computer name function in the kernel 32.dll. Still in our monitored database, let's take a quick look at query current users. This is the query our administrative database is going to execute to find out who is currently logged into this database. It's a very simple query. We're going to select the columns that the administrative database is expecting. So this is where you as an administrative database uh, author would tell the uh, owners of their databases. You, you would tell them, I want to see computer name, a login name, and a login date time. That's all I want you to tell me. I don't care how you do it, how you get it. That's what I want to see in the record set that you delivered to me. So then they would come and write this query based on the, the, the structure of their audit table, right? And this particular query is very, uh, very simple. Select those columns from audit logins where the outdate time is null. Go back to our administrative database and then go into the code for our administrative database. So we only have a few changes in the code of this database when compared to the Jet User Roster version. Okay, now I'm using the code base from part three of this series where we're using an array to keep track of the connection objects for each of the databases we want to monitor. I have changed the name of our main function that gets the users. We are still clearing out our users logged in table before we begin. Then we, make, we have a small change to the query and the record set that comes from the monitor databases table. We've added to that table a new column called user list query. And this is so we know the name of the query to execute in each database that we're monitoring. So we're adding that to our record set, RS2. We then loop through this record set. We're still checking to see if we have a valid path for each database we want to monitor. We're still using the same connection array and the same functions to find the connection object for each database in that connection array. After we find the connection object to use, we then have a different query here, whereas before we were querying the Jet User Roster, now we're going to execute that query from the backend database we're currently monitoring. That's coming from the record set we just opened right above. So we have an RS, a record set dot open method here, and this is the SQL we're going to execute. Select star from, and you put the name of that query in that other database that you want to execute. So you're querying a query, essentially. And then we have here, of course, comma, the connection object itself. The rest is equivalent code. Now we are, we are inserting different data, slightly different data, into our user's logged in table. We are still using the database ID, which is the primary key from the monitored databases table. We're still using the same database name from that same table. The computer name now is coming from our query. The login name is also coming from our query, and it's going to be uh, equivalent to uh, the user that is logged in to that other machine that logged into that other back end. And the login date is also coming from that new query. Everything else is the same. So back over here, and I can run that. You can see here that we've got, I've got one database open with my laptop, and it is the Ray Toshiba my user account on that machine, whoops, my user account on that machine is rlhar underscore zero 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 and I open that database 
Uh, it looks like a current time is about 10 p.m., so about an hour and a half ago. And when I log out of that database, the current the time of that logout will be logged in that audit table in that backend database. Well, thanks a lot for joining us on this video. I will put links in the description below this video of the previous parts of this series, as well as the code listing for uh, part three, which you could look at to uh, you know compare to the code listing that I'll also put down there for this video. Thanks for watching. Hope you got something out of it. Please don't forget to subscribe, and we will see you next time.